Great to have you join us on Breakfast Central on a Friday morning. It's been a very interesting week with loads of stories that we've been through this week. And of course, you know, we appreciate everyone who has been a part of our journey for the whole of the week as we inch closer and closer to the end of the month of May. Um, we, of course, you know, would like to remind you to please join us this morning for the next two hours and share your thoughts with us, you know, at some point when the phone lines are open. Let's have your thoughts on some of the stories that we're going to be discussing today. It's going to be another very interesting two hours. Our social media handle is also available at any point during the show uh, that you could tweet at us. I am Osaogie Ogbawa. And I am Olive Emwadi. Thank you so much for joining us all through the week. A lot has happened. It's been expose upon expose, the most recent being the KPMG forensic audit in Abia State, auditing the time of Governor Iqbazu, looking at uh, certain 10 billion that was uh, allocated for the airport project, but now has been said to have been diverted, allegedly to 32 accounts. We'll be reacting to this. Of course, Governor uh, Iqbazu has reacted to this. Uh, his reaction isn't quite pretty, and social media has certainly had different reactions. These are some of the stories that we're going to be looking at this morning Absolutely. on Breakfast Central. Absolutely. Um, I mean, yes, like you've said, you know, very, very disappointing reaction um, or response. I'm not sure if there's more to it, you know, but from the video clips that, you know, that everyone has seen, okay, he doesn't answer the question, you know, you know, you talk about a trade port, okay? Yeah. Still doesn't answer the question, you know, about what happened to the money, because there's still no airport. Airport, trade port, Akara port, uh, uh, Ukwa port, uh, Aba, uh, uh, Onugu port, doesn't, <laughs> doesn't matter what he wants to call it. The fact is, there's no, no port. Airport. Well, you know, and according so what do, to what him, like to he money? said, he wanted to bring Aria Aria to the airport. But okay. there was something that he said that stood out for me. He said that uh, at the end of the day, 10, 10 billion wouldn't have been enough for an airport anyway. So if you knew 10 billion wouldn't have been enough for an money? airport, why did you embark on that journey in the first place? And then when you decided to change the course of action, did you get approval for that? Was this made known publicly? You know, was there sufficient explanation the, to that? The, I, I mean, it's just a number of mind-boggling questions have arisen out of this. And it's, I think going forward, it's imperative that we conduct forensic audits of, I mean, we've been saying it here. Of it's not even going forward. That should be normal. There should yeah, be a, a state you know, process of auditing every single, you know, uh, fund uh, transfer that goes through the but state I don't I, I There's an auditor general of the state. A, I think it should even be, at this point, I'm starting to think that private individuals should be... Should be no, 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 no. I mean, there is already, there's already structures that are set up on the state level, on every level. Abia State already has. This exactly. This part of what, so, what uh, he's complaining about, that Governor Alex Oti is wasting a lot of money because they already have a state audit that uh, should be able to cater to this. And okay. So um, I hope that, you know, you, I mean, I, I want to see where this leads, you know, because unfortunately, Abia has received, you know, arguably some of the worst, you know, back-to-back -back leadership, you know, you know, that from, for many states in the southeast, from uh, the Imba Jinuju days to, um, what's his name now, Ojo Zokalu to uh, Mipazu, it's been back-to-back -back disaster. But it looks and that's like what Alex, they would Oti, Alex Oti seems to be the breath of fresh so air that so, they have. Yeah. And if you do see, if you gauge the pulse of the people on social media, the public, everybody keeps asking. I mean, they seem to rally much around uh, Governor Alex Oti, and everyone's asking Iqbazu, they're calling for his head, asking that he be thrown into jail. You know, they, they talk about the rules. They say, if you say that the airport wasn't good enough, and the 10 billion wasn't enough for an airport, and that everyone is fixated on an airport, whereas the roads leading to the airport aren't good, which is a valid argument, in my opinion. However, if you're going to do that, right, can you provide these roads? A number of well, people have even called out these roads that he said he fixed. Yeah. And, you know, some residents have said that that's not really the reality of what they yeah. see there. So, 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 you know, the whole process will go beyond just Alex Oti. Um, he will do the one that he can as governor, but of course, you know, still left for, you know, the other state st um, um, structures, you know, to investigate, to show. And of course, you know, if the FCC needs to invite the former governor, then they will. But I, I want us to also mention something that I thought, you know, created a lot of conversations yesterday and I think is very important. And that is the complete neglect, um, the complete abandonment of the International Day of the Boy Child yesterday. It was the 16th of May, it's meant to be recognized across the world. And if you look, you know, back just not very long ago, when there's moments when the International Day, Day of the Girl Child is celebrated, everybody jumps up, tears their, oh, they are ready to create the most fascinating social media posts. Every single, from banking to, you know, to telecoms, to UNESCO, UNICEF, the United Nations, the federal government, state governments, everybody is all 
celebratory about International Day of the Girl Child. But yesterday it came, and nobody, not one person, I think it was just one bank in Nigeria that made a post. Every single person ignored and abandoned the International Day of the Boy Child yesterday, which is very sad. Because when we eventually start to talk about the norm and the, the, the issues that the boy child, boy child, I beg your pardon, has um, later on in life, it is because of these levels of neglect and because we always just assume that they don't matter. Which is, once again, very, very unfair. It is the boy child that eventually becomes the man that, of course, suffers some of the worst metrics in society. They are most likely to die in war. They are most likely com to commit suicide. They suffer homelessness more. They have the worst life ex expectancy. They are, most they are least likely to be saved in disaster. You never, you barely ever hear of the men. Look at what's going on in Gaza. You barely hear about the men who have died there. We're talking about 40,000 men well, or people who have died. You barely hear about the men. Nobody talks about them. It's always women and children, women and children, women and children, which should be talked about. But I'm just trying to express how unfair society has become and has always been to men, but it's barely spoken about. And yesterday was another very clear example of how it almost doesn't matter when we're talking about the International Day of the Boy Child. But let it be, I mean, let, just give one instance where there has to be the celebration of the International Day of the Girl Child. I say everybody come with all their whole, you know, caricature ready to celebrate, which is great, which is great. And it should be celebrated. Women, girls, everybody should be celebrated and protected. But the boy child should not be neglected as it was yesterday. And I found, I found it very, very painful that that's exactly what we experienced yesterday. Okay. Um, so a lot of work needs to be done. All right. Um, before I cry on television something. Okay, let me say something about that. Uh, and I completely agree that the boy child needs to be celebrated. I totally Not agree. celebrated. I, I, I would also mention, I'm sorry. Okay. Just, I'm sorry. One of our sister TV stations, not a sister TV station, one of the stations here in Lagos, you know, um, did a, a whole three-minute, you know, um, report or documentary on the boy child. And it was centered around how, the, you know, the boy child needs help mentally. It's a very disgusting narrative. The boy child. And talked about, you know, I mean, you know the way that when you talk about the, the girl child, how she needs to protect it, how, you know, society needs to. But yesterday's, you know, on some other TV station, you know, you're talking about how, you know, mental health and, and abuse and drugs and how they need to, to you know, cut out the boy child so that it doesn't then become violent to the girl child. So the narrative that was sold yesterday is like the, the boy child is just some, some engine that, you know, you need to pour engine oil inside, you know, and of course, you know, to protect the girl child from... from. It, it was very, very unfair, very disgusting. I can't call their names. But okay. I so, I, like I said earlier, I agree that the boy child should be celebrated, the boy child should be protected, the boy child should be taken care of, and that the boy child, the needs of the boy child are no less important, you know, than the needs of the girl child. You know, I completely agree with that. Um, and the, and I'm going to bring the International Women's Day celebration, if I, if I may make reference to that. I remember when we had the International Women's Day celebration and the people who were clamoring that, oh, look at now, International Women's Day celebration is all over the place. And, you know, when is now International Day of International Men's Day, no one is going to celebrate it. And I remember saying to the person, I said, okay, uh, th they said that we are telling the stories of women, that why don't we tell the stories of men? I said, if you check for the most part, women, we don't take the International Women's Day celebrations lying low. We're very, very personal about it. We go as far as we'll do photo shoots, we'll do videos, we'll do campaigns, we'll share all of this on social media. But not a lot of men actually celebrate, even International Men's Day. As far back as I can remember, I think it only started to catch fire two years ago. Because if nobody will tell your stories, the way we say Africans should tell African stories. That's always, that, that, so, that is always the quickest. So I, and I that, accepted that you would say this. So, that, that's always the so, quickest. And I, because I know where you're going. No, no, no. That's but, always the quickest you know, response to but is why truth? is the boy how child... How many men you, have you, actually you know, done ignored. anything to... How many men actually take things like, for example, mentorship and do these events, right? It's, you don't... If I'm telling stories, the, I tell stories on my own a lot about women. And I'm yeah. not saying that, you know, we shouldn't support... Of course, when we see injustice being done about men... Or, I, mean, I mean, once again, I, I, I saw this yesterday... I know this is the quickest response. But it or is why the don't truth. why don't you know men it do is the same the thing? But it's it is a societal thing. I agree. It is not a oh why don't you fight for yourselves? It is a societal I thing, agree. and it's the same way. This is what, that's why I mentioned yesterday that international organizations, banks, FMCGs, everybody, 
always comes out when it's time to celebrate the girl child. It's so not I, a it's not a oh, women do oh, it. But you would know it that. You know, internet, but you would know why they talk about thing. why they celebrate girls. For example, if you're looking at um, United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals, when they are talking about gender equality, they will tell you know that for the longest time, the, the conversation that has been about women being at. You We're know, saying the same thing yes. here. That so, when it's time for the women conversation to be propped up, they do not so what I'm, hold and themselves I agree with back. You. And even I'm okay. talking so about I'm international saying, organizations. So what I'm also. saying is that right now, whilst this is a burning passion, and I think that you and a lot of other men can now start to come together and say, okay, what ways can we start to prioritize conversations about the boy child? You start conversations and then they catch fire and then they become a thing. And we are going to have a whole separate conversation about this. But this morning is not because we've run out of time and our producers have been urging us to move on. Right. So let's share what our headlines today are this morning on Breakfast Central. Have their doubts and you'll understand why. And also we will stop by in Abia State where controversy trails a non-existent airport that of course billions of Nahara uh, have been spent on. And His Excellency Atiku Abubakar condemns federal government's plan to use 20 trillion Naira pension funds, even though they've responded to that. The EFCC launches anti-graft radio station. And we'll be reviewing the newspaper front pages where we open the phone lines and you can be a part of the conversation. Join us this morning. All these and more on Breakfast Central. And now let's bring you breakfast headlines. Hello and welcome to Breakfast Headlines on News Central TV. I am Judith TV. We start off today by telling you that the Nigeria Labour Congress and Trade Union Congress have expressed disappointment over the 48,000 minimum wage proposed by the federal government, saying that the wage proposal is insensitive and significantly short in meeting the needs of the Nigerian workers. The president of Nigeria Labor Congress, Joa Jaori, and the vice president of Trade Union Congress, Tommy Etim, made the assertion in a media conference yesterday, immediately after the national minimum wage negotiation with the federal government in, in Abuja uh, on Wednesday. And on to education, where the Academic Staff Union of Universities has threatened to down tools after two weeks if the President Bola Tinubu administration fails to pay public university lecturers their withheld salaries. ASU President Emmanuel Oshodeke said it is unfair for the federal government to pay lecturers four months of their 2022 withheld salaries and hold on to that of three and a half months. And on to River State with a bit of politics now, where a major showdown is eminent between the state governor, and that's Simina Laya Fubara, and the 23 local government chairman of the state, as he warned the council bosses to be mindful of their actions as their tenure elapses in a few days. Fubara handed down the warning at the flag off of the Elele. Omoku Road in the state on Thursday yesterday. The governor advised against halting anyone in the guise of supporting any politician in the state. And on to security matters, where some yet-to-be-identified gunmen have kidnapped a Catholic priest, Reverend Father Basil Chukwemeka, at Mpo Junction near the commercial city Onicha in Anambra State. According to eyewitnesses, the Reverend Father was abducted from his vehicle while driving around the area. The State Police Command spokesperson, SP Tuchu, uh, Do Chuku Ikenga, confirmed the incident in a statement when, when contacted. Ikenga said the Commissioner of Police, uh, Nanga Obonu Itam, had addressed the Catholic priests on the development in the Bishop Conference at Onicha. And still on security issues, or your state commissioner of police, Hamzat Adebola, on Thursday paraded the former chairman, PAC management system, Lamidi uh, Mukale, uh, from, uh, fondly called auxiliary. The Department of State Services uh, on Tuesday arrested the uh, arrested auxiliary at his Olodo residence in Ibadan, the state capital, months after the police had declared him uh, wanted for allegedly involving in a series of armed robbery, kidnapping, and murder cases.
And now to North Africa, where Tunisia's President Kais Zaid on Thursday criticized foreign interference after an international backlash over recent arrests of journalists, political uh, commentators and lawyers, which he defended as lawful. Now, civil society in the North African country condemned the arrest as a crackdown on dissent in the country that saw the onset of the Arab Spring. And that's all on Breakfast Headlines. Back to us uh, and Olive. Good morning, guys. Good morning, Judith. Thank you very much for bringing us Breakfast Headlines. A number of stories there. Interesting one there with uh, the Nigerian Labour Congress pulling out of the 48,000 naira offer by the federal government. Uh, to be honest, a number of people agree that that's not a very practical living wage, or that's not a that's not a money that the average person, not even the average person, because if you consider the cost of living with inflation at uh, 33 percent, with food inflation at about 40 percent, it's not very practical that that figure will work. But it's also not very practical that their ask or their demand will work. So if Labour really is passionate about the Nigerian worker, they must, they must be very realistic in their approach. Find out what we're working with. Because this back and forth is not helping anybody. They're not implementing the new Labour wage. People are still getting paid the old Labour wage. We'll go back and forth, and this will last for months, and people are still struggling. Let's not pretend that people are not trekking miles daily just because they can't afford transport fare. So the sooner they resolve this, the better for the average Nigerian worker. Right. I mean, and, and to be fair, uh, to be fair to the Congress, and that's TUC and NLC, they shouldn't even be um, having to call the government to ask for an increase. And, and that's why when they said that it was insensible at that figure at 48,000 naira, they kind of make a point, you know, because the government should be, you know, to be to the grassroots and understand what is, what's going on. They have the intelligence. They understand that uh, we're heavily tasked at this time. They understand. They can see from the inflation rates, you know, um, the high cost of food and every other uh, things that's going on in, in, uh, in terms of our social economy. So they ought to know, instead of them asking for this, it should be implemented. It should be a conversation that's had between all the heads of, you know, whatever parasitists to sit down and say, okay, look, how can we make the lives of, our, of Nigerians, and that means by extension the Nigerian workers, better? What is a sensible amount that would be able to, I mean, 48,000 naira can't even buy you a bag of rice. You know, so, a, so I, I mean, to be fair to them, they shouldn't be asking for this. This should be the top of the list in terms of priorities uh, in making life better for Nigerians. So um, whatever it takes for them to get a fair, fair amount, uh, so they can feel like they are being compensated for work and they're able to have a standard of leaving, a standard way of leaving. I, I'm here yeah. for it. I'm here for I, it. I just wanted to mention that uh, beans must feel very neglected, uh, like the boy child in this conversation, because everyone just keeps saying, you know, bag of rice, bag of rice, bag of rice. <laughs> Nobody ever talks about beans. Um, I don't oh, know look, how beans feel. Also, also look, um, I'm, see, look, I am a, an educator by profession. Um, so... I understand um, your grievances, and I, to be honest, I'm with you on, on that boat right there. Um, and the honest truth of the matter is that um, uh, over the years, which is fair, you know, when you think about it in terms of SDGs and the needs of, uh, of the girl child, and the fact that for a very long time there's a lot of ills of the society that affects the girl child, and it needs a fair attention, good and fine, but also I think that Given the proliferation of social media, the proliferation of all of these ideals that we're seeing, you know, with misogyny and, you know, and incels and all these other things that we're seeing on the internet and who they, and who young boys perceive to be role models, I feel like attention should also be given to boys as well. And very, very, very quickly, you know, because there's so much going on on social media. Um, the people that this young boys idolize, it worries me. There's also the proliferation of, you know, of this, you know, status symbol of, you know, the music that we see, the narrative that comes from our Nigerian music, the people that they idolize in these spaces. You know, attention needs to be given. So um, it's, and it I starts mean, with us as media as well. You know, I'm not going to remove myself from the situation. I'm not I going mean, to say I don't enjoy the attention that women and girls are getting. I'm a, I'm a woman's woman. I'm a girl's girl. I love it. But at the same time, we won't be tackling these issues if we don't face the boys as well. So the, we have to the, catch them young. The boys we're talking about are giving birth to by women. You know, so if you wouldn't even celebrate your sons, you know, because you're waiting for all, you know, men to celebrate you first, you know, I, I don't know about that. Um, but, you know, I 100% agree, you know, that there has to be more of these conversations. You know, we're not expecting boys to just grow up 
you know, with the ills of society and deal with it. And, you know, there is, there's already that, you know, there's already that mentality from the average man. He doesn't, he doesn't complain. Men have always felt like that. That's the truth. For a long time, even in marriage, there's already that narrative that you will be abandoned when you are, you know, 60, 70. Oh, also, yeah, but the problems that... I'm just saying, I'm, I, because we're out of time. I just wanted to say that there's already that part where men don't really complain, even when we know that these things are our reality. And so... It should be a conscious effort, you know, by international organizations and whatever effort is necessary to remember the boy child and the society that he's growing up in and how unfairly he's treated. Because there's too many metrics that show that men actually on the receiving end of life are not worse. And they're barely a part of any conversation, even when they die. So um, it, should be, it should be spoken about. And I, I'm happy that you mentioned that. Same thing, well, um, Olive. Um, but we're out of time. We'll, we'll see you again at 9. Yeah, sure. Thanks for stopping by. Most welcome. All right. All right. Um, conversations continue this morning. It's not just all about the boy child. There's so many other things to talk about. Um, we'll take a short break. When we come back, let's move into our top stories. Welcome once again. The committee set up by the Delta State Governor, Sherry Fabor-Wuri, for the resettlement of displaced people of Okwama community in Ugeli South local government area of the state says the IDP camp is now ready and, um, of course, set to receive displaced persons from the community. Residents of Okwama fled their homes after the invasion of the, uh, of the community by the army in retaliation of the killing of 17 soldiers on the 14th of March. The question now is, how prepared are, the, of course, these residents for the returning natives of Okwama to stay in the camp prepared by the government? New Central's Austin Azu tells us more about this report. The activation of the camp for the internally displaced Idijin and residents of Okwama community is coming 59 days after the bloodbath and subsequent announcements of military withdrawal from the community by the Delta State Governor last week. The camp is situated at the traditional headquarters of Ewurubu Kingdom in Ugeli South local government area of the state. The chairman of the committee saddled with the responsibility of establishing the camp, conducted journalists around the facility. He said the committee has received food items, beddings, generator sets, medicals and other basic items necessary for the camp to kick off. He noted the displeasure expressed by some of the displaced persons who prefer the camp to be situated at Okwama, but appealed to them to come over to the campsite which he says is just the first step of a long-term solution. He maintained that the committee was constituted when Okwama people were staying in the bush and the army stayed in the community, so it didn't create room to better engagement. If the people could stay in their ancestral home, no matter the conditions and all of that, you cannot say that of people, third parties, who will go there to attend to them. What we have guaranteed is that whatever we take to feed them we have made provision for you understand we have made provision for by way of budget new central however visited the kwama community where the returnees seems to be picking up the pieces of their lives this is St. Peter's Anglican Church, the only building standing in Okwama community at the moment. This is where the people who fled the community returned back and they started living here for the meantime. Ewu, we not go go. All of us, all of us not go go Ewu. If you want to build cap for us, come here to build cap for, for here. If you build cap for here, all of our people go come. If you not build cap for here, nobody go come. Somebody was not telling me that we should go camp for, for, for Ewu. Yes, but 35 years services, a common civil servant, they destroy everything. Because here we have some cassavas in the forest, which our people can still harvest. But if, if we decide to go to Ewuna, I don't think we can harvest those crops. They will lot in the bush. Those ones that the, our neighboring community uh, looted, the ones that are still remaining, if we stay here, we can be able to harvest them. So we want the government to set the IDP camp here. We can manage here. But if we decide to go to Ewu, I don't think we can survive there. We know that the government will cater for us there, but 
we cannot survive. Stay in our own land, our ancestral land. It's more preferable to us than going to an IDP camp, camp in Ewu. We prefer that the IDP camp should be set here in Okwama community. The inhabitants of Okwama are expectant and they are hopeful that they will pick up the pieces of their lives again and rebuild their walls no matter what and time is going to cost them. In Okwama community, in Delta State, for New Central, Austin, Azu. All right, thanks a lot uh, to Austin Azu. And of course, uh, those are the latest developments from the Okwama um, crisis. Um, you know, I, I think I did mention earlier, I spoke about this, you know, a couple of weeks ago, you know, that um, I, I feel hurt, you know, for these people, you know, and how, it's the reality of being, you know, in certain parts of the country and, and being in Nigeria and how you can, you know, you have a life today and, you know, a couple of days, damage. a couple of days you are in the IDP camp, mm -hmm. you know, and how easy it is, you know, that we can just move people from their, you know, from normalcy into an IDP camp. There's always resources for an IDP camp, always resources, but there's never really the, the questions, you know, as to who failed these people, none of them woke up in the morning when 2024 was starting and said to themselves that they would want to move to IDP camps. Not, I mean, they had some plan for 2024. They had some plan from their community, from their local government, from you know, the local main councils of how they were going to leave 20, you know, 2024. Now, they're talking about IDP camps. And of course, the question again is, why are they moving to IDP camps? What Who happened to their communities? communities? You know, exactly. Who's, who's responsible for damaging and destroying their communities? Who's going to take responsibility for failing to protect these people while, of course, you know, they're moving to IDP camps? We need to know what exactly happened in Okwama, right? Uh, we've talked about this for the longest time. And we said that adequate investigation needs to have happened. But who should have conducted the investigation? It was said that the military was the one conducting the investigation. You know, I say if the army is conducting the investigation in, in, a, in a situation that the army has been badly burnt from, is that, not, uh, is that not a conflict of interest? Because you can't be said to be a judge in your own cause. So it would have made sense to have an independent body investigate what happened at Okwama, who carried out the reprisal attacks, who carried out the killings in the first place of the army officers. And these individuals need to be made to dance to the tune of the music they've played and not the innocent. It's, it's been said that it's better for a thousand guilty people to go, go scot-free than for one innocent to be apprehended. But that's not the case that has happened to Okwama. Let's move away from Nigeria and head to a very interesting international story, you would say. Emirates Airlines is set to resume flight operations to Nigerian airports after two years of halting operations in Nigeria. Despite various disclosures in the past year that it will return, Emirates plans to resume daily Dubai to Lagos on the Boeing 777-300ER on the 1st of October, according to carrier statements and booking systems. Now, Emirates uh, flew to Nigeria between 2004 and 2022. The abrupt end uh, two years ago was due to the carrier's inability to repatriate revenue in U.S. dollar. The carrier transported hundreds of thousands of passengers annually, but was able, uh, unable rather, to benefit financially from it. Division Minister Festus K. Amahad on Wednesday announced that he met with the ambassador of the United Arab Emirates to Nigeria, Salim Said Al Shamsi, on, uh, in Abuja on Tuesday. Kemo said the envoy handed him a correspondence from the UAE-based airline, assuring him that a date had been given for the resumption of flights to Nigeria. Let's quickly watch that. We're joined this morning by Assistant Secretary General, Aviation Safety Roundtable Initiative, ART, Olumide Unwayo. Good morning and thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, <laughs> I can see myself on screen behind you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I want, you know, your, your, first of all, your thoughts. You know, there's people who have mixed reactions. Um, about this, you know, they say, well, I mean, it might be good that, you know, Emirates is resuming flights on the 1st of October, but there's still a visa ban, you know, so to some extent um, of, uh, you know, for, for travelers moving to the UAE and, and Dubai. So can you clarify that? Is there still a visa ban? Is the, you know, uh, um, uh, flights back on the 1st of you know, October, maybe nothing to celebrate? Well, uh, um, let, let me first congratulate Emirates on coming back. Um, they went at the time when the, the remittance of the uh, force in Nigeria was stopped, uh, the, the, the fares were high and um, they tried to beat, uh, reduce some of their costs, especially the aviation fuel, to pay in Naira, and the suppliers refused and I said they were going to accept all uh, the dollars, which was in the agreement. So that's, those were the reasons why they pulled out. And they're uh, coupled with the visa ban. Now, uh, they are coming back on October 1st. I doubt if um, 
that operation will start without returning the visa policy for Nigerians to fly because uh, Emirates, Emirates don't come here. It's only Nigerians that, that fly. The uh, majority of their passengers are Nigerians. About 90, 95% of the passengers, they, they fly from very in and out are Nigerians. So they will need the visa ban to be lifted for that operation to be successful. So another beauty of it is that uh, on returning, it, uh, Emirates is a uh, strong international connecting flights uh, with most of its passengers going beyond Dubai. So you can be sure that if they return, international fares will drop by virtue of having more seats available to Nigerian passengers to fly to, to, to different countries. So that's another plus for us. Then on the other on the flip side of it, what, what are they giving, what are they bringing to the table for the uh, for Nigerian operators? In the past, uh, Emirates had 40 slots into Lagos and several into Abuja. That's 21 slots a week. And it was difficult for LPs um, in the past to get the slot into Dubai. And you know, that caused a lot of uh, diplomatic um, uh, buhar towards the end of uh, the last government, the end, the end of the of the last government. So I think this, all this must be clear and um, uh, clearly said to this time around. Well, if they're coming to Lagos and Abuja, they must also make Dubai and uh, another city in the United Arab Emirates of uh, uh, the choice of our airline available. Those two cities must be available, and slots must be given to land at the airport at the time those airlines want. Because if we are giving them those free way to land at our own prime airports, this must be this must be reciprocated as stated clearly in the bilateral service agreement, and that's what I want the government to clear uh, clear clear now before commencement of flights in October. So, can, can I clarify this point you're making now? Um, the the service agreement must accommodate. Are you talking about the other local airlines from Nigeria, Airpeace and the likes? Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Whoever is going to represent Nigeria on the on the route must have access to Dubai Airport and okay. also to a second city. If Emirates is returning to Lagos and Abuja, I must also have 21 frequencies and slots available in those airports. It's not negotiable. It's part of the bilateral system. That was not, but that was not a shine in the past because nobody supported uh, the the airline, the, the the Nigerian airline that was uh, that was that was put out there, and they, they were thrown into airports outside Dubai and given uh, schedules that were unfavorable. Now that must change and must be part of the conditions for before resumption of flight. Again, uh, visa uh, the, the visa ban must also be lifted. Must not not it's not optional. Because if you do not leave the visa ban, then you do not have enough passengers on that route. So they must leave the visa ban where Nigerians can also travel. All right, this is a valid argument that you have put forward that should be in the agreement. Now let's talk about how you assess the significance of uh, the airline returning to Nigeria. How is it beneficial you know, for the Emirates? How is it beneficial for Nigerians? Uh, particularly, of course, we see that there will be increased connectivity and options for travelers. But do you see the economic benefits for both countries? Well, um, you, you remember, Emirates just declared a profit of $5 billion. That was without even operating, operating Nigerian routes in the last few years. So yeah. it shows a very strong, viable airline that can do without the Nigerian routes. But now that they're coming back, they must have some value in it. Uh, they, there's, no, there's nobody that does not want to increase its profit. Uh, and I think they are, they are eager to return to Nigeria because for them to have been operating 21 slots with an aircraft that has a minimum of 100 passengers, you can be sure they are making good good money and good profit. And nobody nobody wants to lose that profit. Again, they've lost, they lost, they lost a lot of market share to Qatar Airways and um, other airlines, um, other North African airlines and Middle Eastern airlines. So I think it's time to come back and fight for their rightful place. But as, as they're doing this, you can be, sure, you can be assured that an airline that operates 21 flights a week into Nigeria is bringing more jobs, there's that um, value to the, to the, to the aviation ecosystem, uh, the hotels, taxi drivers, baggage cleaners. You know, the entire chain tend, tend to benefit from that um, extra flight that, that's coming in. You are, you are looking at more jobs from that for those working within the aviation ecosystem. And I can tell you, most importantly, that fears will drop because they are they, they are they are they are a very connected international airline that go beyond Dubai, and almost eighty percent of their passengers go beyond Dubai. So. You can be sure that there'll be condition. There are more seats available for Nigeria now to see which one is cheaper for them to go to anywhere in the world, and Emirates is going to bring that in. But then, on the yeah. flip side, there's a bilateral service agreement between two countries, and those and the bilateral service agreement says you must have, uh, you, you should also have a Nigerian carrier or carriers going 
to, to the UAE. So we must ensure that before this, they start this flight, it must be clearly stated that if we are giving you 21 slots sl 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 into Lagos and Abuja, our own airline must have 21 slots into Dubai and any other on, on the circumstances uh, in, in the agreement. And that, that must be, that must be worse the South. We do not go back into the crisis that happened the last time before they stop flying. I, I want to go back to a question, uh, pardon me. I want to go back to the initial conversation we had where you, you talked about Emirates declaring their profit and not really needing Nigeria in that sense. You also mentioned that uh, we, whoever's representing Nigeria, must insist that the, you know, we have our number, I think about 21 spaces, I think 21 slots, you said, uh, in Dubai and in one other country, if I got you correctly. Now, if you say that the Emirates has declared profits and does not necessarily need Nigeria, do you think that it'd be, uh, that this demand will be met, this demand on the negotiation table, do you think that it will be met? And if it isn't met, what do you advise be done? Uh, it is not, it is not optional now. It's not optional. You see, the problem is we, we tend to see our airlines as privately owned and that don't, um, are not, we're not giving the necessary public support. Once you ask an airline to leave Nigeria on a scheduled flight to, to fly to another country, airlines cannot fly on their own. They are designated by the government. And once you designate that airline, it becomes your flag carrier on that route, irrespective of the ownership. You are the one that designated that airline. So once you designate that airline, it must, they, they, they must have the backing of the Ministry of um, Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Justice, Ministry of Aviation, the Nigerian Aviation Authority, and whatever government agencies that it needs, it needs the help to sort out issues in the countries it's operating to. Now, if, I, if my basic services says you are, you are having to trust um, frequencies each into the other country and maybe more than one des uh, 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 destination, then if I have given you 21 into my own country, then you are also giving me 21. When, when, why would I have 21 frequencies? You have given me 21 on the paper. Then I want to get over there to, to the airport and they tell me there is no space. So of what value is my 21 frequencies that they have given to me when I don't have slots to land at that airport? And that's what I'm talking about now. That all these things must be put in place, must be regarded for that. If you are coming to Lagos, if you want 10 what is slots in two Lagos, and, and then at any time the general operator is ready, you must also have what is slots in two Dubai, your private airport. Because MM, MM, MMIA is our own private airport. So if you are giving you 40 slots, you must offer that for same 40 slots. It must, it must tell us that we don't talk in the same places. Again, uh, they, they, they also need to renegotiate with their square suppliers. Because if you are here and you want to buy in Naira and they keep it system, you must pay in dollars. This is this cannot this does not involve the government. It has to be within the, the buyer and seller. And I think Emirates should uh, work on that now. Uh, um, yeah, and that, that's what I was about, you know, getting well, into. Well, they the so we don't have the same price that happened before they left. Yeah, I mean, I was just about to, you know, get into that aspect, you know, because, you know, but first of all, you know, I think it's important to clarify that the Emir Emirates resumption is not just about the UAE. There's many other travel destinations that Nigerians, you know, have access to through the Emirates Airlines. Um, so there's that one. And then second, how do we, you know, avoid the um, issues with repatriation of um, funds that initially started this crisis? And do you think that the Nigerian government currently, under Festus Kayamo, has you know been able to sort out those issues, and and you we're not going to have this repeat itself? Yeah, I, I think the first thing they did, uh, what they've done with the, with the violation of the Naira to float at the to float at the British at the black market has uh, solved uh, um, any issue of increasing the number of funds that will be trapped. Uh, because with that now, um, there is not in the past there was a special rate of uh, exchange for the airlines which was much, much more lower than the, the prevailing market rate. And with that uh, being lower, that uh, helps the ticket to go to be cheaper. But now that the, the exchange is almost parallel with the black market rate, I don't think the, the airlines uh, would have problem repatriating their, their funds any, anymore. Now, this, uh, the truth is, what was cleared by this government was the ones that the funds sent by their bankers to the Central Bank of Nigeria when they bid it to, to, for, for, dollar, for, for dollars. It is those funds that were trapped in the central bank that has been cleared. These airlines still have money in their account. They are supposed to be remitted to their country that are still trapped because they, 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 they are going to be at a loss now, changing at the changing uh, changing those funds to dollars at the rate at which uh, the, the naira is going for naira uh, uh, has been exchanged compared to when it was sold. If you know what I mean, but then they were selling selling at maybe 400, 500 uh, naira to a dollar, but now uh, dollars over uh, one thousand naira. So. I don't think it would be very difficult for them to say they want to 
change the dollars around. I think you start looking for a third party business whether where they can exchange naira for for dollar. But but now it, it has not been left for the airlines to get to get over that problem and no more the, uh, the government is But this, some of these funds are trapped and um, the new exchange rate has not eased that yeah, that difficulty because now that the exchange rate is parallel with the, the, the special window, the IFE window mm -hmm. which the LS use is now parallel with the black market rate. So I think that the issue of uh, uh, funds getting trapped will not be an issue anymore. But let us enjoy right. uh, the, the return of um, Emirates. Let us enjoy the, in, the seats that were provided by the, the, by the return to the, to the Lagos and Abuja route. Let us enjoy the fears that will be affected by the capacity they're going to introduce. And let us enjoy that, that, that yes, Nigeria yeah. doesn't have options of traveling in different parts of the world yeah. through Emirates Airlines. Fingers okay. crossed. The most important thing is we need to have our own airline to join that route. Yeah, fingers crossed. There's still a lot you know, of time between now and the 1st of October. And you know, like you said, we're hoping that other airlines can also pick up you know, and be a part of you know, this whole uh, the, the conversation, including Airpiece, you know, which has been celebrated lately for its um, um, UK uh, flights. Um, but I, I want you, you know, to share. You know, Fester Skyam, of course, you know, going to be one year in a bit as aviation minister. What targets do you think that he should, you know, have at this point? Nigeria Air, you know, is still hanging, you know, on the thread. What are the targets that you think that the Nigeria's aviation ministry should set? between now and maybe the next couple of years, um, you know, inclusive of this Emirates deal, what other things should we be looking at? Well, um, I, I think we should uh, work on having more airlines. Uh, we should um, look at building, uh, look, at, look at the regulations and see whether we can set up a new rule regulations for a lower tier, uh, tier aircraft. What I mean here is uh, aircraft that are less than maybe 20, 25 seater that can run the small and the thin routes, be Benin, Portacourt, Portacourt, Oweri, Kano, Kano, Midobri. You know, we, we need uh, we, we need to license a new set of a, a group so that we can have more airlines in place. We, are, we because as, at the moment we still have issues with um, passengers not having seats or flights uh, not being available, and uh, that has also made the, the ticket fare to increase. I think we need to do that. We also need to strengthen uh, the uh, the uh, uh, support. For any of the airlines we are asking to operate outside Nigeria, because if we do not show that love and uh, we don't show that backing and uh, and uh, that power, that uh, yes, this is a flat carrier and we are behind it, but they will they will be lost in the aero politics that is uh, normally uh, that's normally seen when it comes to international flights. I think we need to support that again. We need to actually find a forget attract investors to see how they can invest in our airlines. Rwanda has Qatar investing there. In both the carrier and the airport, will be uh, they are also going to, to an airline in South Africa. Yet, um, with all the airlines we have in Nigeria, we have the most vibrant domestic market in the, in, the, in in Africa. Yet, no foreign investor is coming. In. And there must be something we are not doing right, and that's the thing that we need to look for. And then, and well, me they, why I want to go through this is the infrastructure. All right, uh, well, then, why I would have to wrap up the conversation now and have you join us again some other time. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we look forward to seeing how this eventually plays out and like, that the arguments and the, you know, the, the negotiation favors Nigeria as well in the conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right. Now let's move on. Nigeria's Economic and Financial Crimes Commission has launched a radio station in the nation's capital, Abuja, as part of its effort to improve on its operations against corruption. The commission says that the pioneering anti-graft radio station, the first of its kind in Africa, who provide daily information, enlightenment, entertainment, and anti-corruption campaigns to the public. News Central's Joshua Imari tells us more. With Nigeria's anti-graft agency, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, stepping up its tempo in fighting financial crimes, the agency this time has set up its own radio station. The EFCC says its radio station is designed to mobilize citizens against corruption, and provide a platform for public engagement and education, hoping to have an impact in fighting graft and enlightening the public on its operational activities. But for us in the FCC, owning a radio station is not just a status symbol, but an important organ of mobilization against graft, where communication and public engagement have the same impact and depth as our operational activities. Indeed, our own radio station, we are in a better position to tell our stories factually ungarnished and undiluted. Stakeholders present commended the initiative saying 
that the activities of the EFCC towards modernizing its operation with citizens in mind can be a game changer. The establishment of the EFCC FM radio is in line with the laws that established EFCC to carry out rigorous public enlightenment to Nigerians both at home and abroad. The EFCC has done tremendously well in this fight. They have generated the necessary awareness and consciousness about the impact and consequences of corrupt practices in Nigeria. These giant strides are highly commendable and I urge the, committee, the Commission not to relent until all corrupt practices are effectively tackled. Indeed, there is still more to be done and the use of radio is the right way to go. The second pillar of our five-point agenda at the Ministry of Information and National Orientation is to amplify the policies and programs of the federal government. And I'm happy that we are now we now have a new partner in the EFCC. The first pillar of that five-point agenda is to restore public trust in communications in Nigeria. Many here say that the establishment of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission radio is another step towards the right direction in the fight against corruption. They add that the radio will help disseminate necessary information to the citizens at the grassroots, helping them to combat misinformation and supporting efforts in eradicating corruption. In Abuja for New Central, I am Joshua Imarai. Thank, right, thank you very much, Joshua. Yeah, um, I mean, I think I think it's a it's it's a brilliant, brilliant. initiative. You know, I people agree. would also argue that it's a waste of time um, and resources. But you know, for whatever um, ways and whatever steps that the EFCC can take to, of course, you know, you improve on public enlightenment against graft and against corruption, you think you can go ahead and do it. Um, I don't know if it's going to be um, a radio station that will be stationed across the whole country or just in the FCT because you know, you know radio signals are going to be are always regional. You can't listen, you know, you know, after outside the FCT. So there's that one. You know, they're going to have regional ones. Like they're going to set up one in the south, south, set up one in the middle belt, set up you know another one in the southwest and in the southeast. You know, to continue their public enlightenment campaigns or not. And another thing is, um, there's also you know still the National or Orientation Agency. That, you know, when, when I see things like this, you know, it's a reminder that the National Orientation Agency is not doing its job. Because that's one of the things that it should be set up for, you know, to, of course, um, enlighten Nigerians better, you know, against, against corruption or whatever other uh, campaigns that it should run. But My thing is, I mean, I agree, it's a laudable uh, project. I think it's, it's a great one. Um, it's helping to bring information closer to the people. It will help to keep people on their toes as well, knowing that, at the end of the day, the EFCC starts investigating you, you would become a topic of conversation on the radio. Who, who knows if that would be a deterrent, but I think that it's a great, it's a great initiative. Uh, we hope that it's an initi initiative that is void of corruption, influence, manipulation by public officers, independent on its own, and that it grants Nigerians and grants the EFCC the transparency that it should have. We look forward to seeing this launch and seeing exactly how it plays out. And... You know, the role that the NBC has to play again in this, the Broadcasting Corporation, we know that you know, sometimes they can be very strict with their rules. I'm, I'm hoping that in, a, in any way they will not clamp down. I mean, some have argued that they sometimes try to stifle the freedom of a number of press, you know, press houses with a lot of bands and all. I don't know what, what their, their programming would look like, but I'm hoping that you know, they can work hand in hand with the, N, NB, uh, the, with the Broadcasting Corporation, the NBC, to ensure yeah. that information is... I don't expect that. It, I don't expect... Yeah, I'm not sure what the content will be like. You know, yes, but... Um, I mean, there's other details. This is it going to be a 24-hour radio station? Yeah, we need to do... We don't, we don't hours, understand so, what the program is. So there's other like details. It. This is going to, also going to be an online radio station. Um, but their programming content, I don't think it will be far off from just speaking against, you know, graft. You know, and then maybe also sharing information on about cases that ES is currently working on, you know, yeah. with, of course, uh, identities of... Um, a person is protected. So I, I don't know that they will, it, I don't expect that there will be any clash with the NBC. Um, it's a federal government um, owned radio station, so they, they will work hand in hand. But time will tell. You know, of course, once again, kudos to the EFCC. We'll like to see how this uh, goes and how far it travels. Uh, let's uh, share with you a quick recap of some of the things we've spoken about in the last hour and also what comes up next. Emirates set to resume flights in Nigeria from the 1st of October. Of course, you know, we had a uh, conversation with Olumide Ohio and also controversy trails a non-existent airport in Abia State after billions had been allocated for it. 
The FCC, of course, launches its anti-graft radio station. Uh, we just spoke about that and, of course, you know what that means. But that's not all this morning. I'll share with you what comes up right next. Coming up next in Breakfast Central, Atiku condemns federal government's plan to use 20 trillion Naira pension funds. And we'll be sharing what our top story of the week is on Breakfast Central. Uh, it's been a number of stories over the week. And right next, we start off with our newspaper front pages. Stay with us. Welcome back. Thank you very much for joining us. If you're tuning in now, you're well in time for our newspaper review. And you know that this is the part where you get to be a part of the show as we open the phone lines and take some of your calls this morning. Now, as we look through the big stories making the headlines, we're joined by uh, the Head Strategy and Public Affairs for Naira Metrics, Wade Ahimia. Good morning and thank you for joining us. Good morning. It's great to be here. Great to have you. Thank All you right. very much. Let's begin with the papers this morning, starting off with Vanguard newspaper. On the front page of Vanguard, most discos are technically insolvent, NERC declares, and this is speaking about electricity. Nigeria has a unique opportunity and potential to achieve energy security and sufficiency for itself and the entire West African sub-region. And uh, this is by John Mahama, the former Ghanaian president. <laughs> There's so many other quotes about Nigeria and its electricity travels. Unveils plan to liquidate Jenko's gas supplier's debt as CFDP, AFDB plans $1 billion uh, support for power sector. How Nigeria can overcome energy crisis. Mahama, Naji, Obi, and Kwankwaso. No plan to illegally use pension funds, says Wali Edu, as NLC TUC threatened federal government over bland, planned uh, borrowing. Emirates resumes flights to Nigeria on October 1st. Salary arrears. Asu threatens no pay, no work after two weeks. My enemies... <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to laugh. My enemies now sleep with eyes open, according to Fubara. In Nigerian language, Pekin Wei saying, Mama no go drink water, drop cup. Himself no go drink water, drop cup. At the top of the paper, Dangote refinery to buy 24 million uh, barrels of crude from U.S., according to a report. Uh, INEC to begin distribution of th 373,030 uncollected PVCs from May 27 uh, regarding the Edo gubernatorial elections. Uh, latest future ratings shows Tinubu's transparency, according to Shetima. And finally, minimum wage labor shuns parley as federal government hints on raising offer. Let's take a look at the next paper. All right, the Daily Trust newspaper becomes um, or Daily Independent. I'm not sure which one now comes next. Uh, let's see what we can find um, over there. It says there um, on the Daily Independent, banks can demand social media handles of customers. Uh, court rules. A lot of burner pages are going to be um, um, popping now. Federal government begins uh, payment of 1.3 trillion gas supply debt. Labor warns federal government against using pension funds for infrastructure development. And also Emirates returns to Nigeria after 23 months. We have defeated those troubling us, says Fubara. Tinubu's government has shown transparency in financial dealings, says Shatima. Electricity tariff um, increase and it st steps, down com step da steps down committee's investigative report indicting the federal government. And also Nigerian troops kill 227 terrorists, rescue 253 from kidnappers. Um, just two other stories I can share. Anambra sacks six directors for certificate forgery and 222 ghost workers. Um... Well, I think those are the stories that we can share on the Daily Independent. We're going to come back to one or two of them. Um, do we have time for the Daily Times? Okay, let's quickly look and see one top story. And okay, all right. We we'll probably would start. Let's 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 bring you know our guest in on. Um, okay, well, on the Daily Times this morning, so we can find. As yeah. threatens to shut uh, to down tools over withheld salaries. It says electricity tariff hike. Senate suspends discussion of a report over court ruling. And also, stay clear of our pension funds, organized labor tells finance minister. Um, we can also find bottom of the screen the IGR, 318.5 billion naira generated in first quarter, accountant general declares. Rivers crisis, PDP dismisses claim of pressure to compromise position in court. Uh, troops actively fighting in, in various theaters of operation, military spokesperson says. And um, doctors and health workers decry federal government's failure to implement 65 to 70 years retirement age. Um, I think we should start the conversation with the with some clarity on the pension fund um, we, um, uh, co um, conversation. While I do, of course, you know, was you know in a video clip yesterday, I think trying to clarify that the federal government has no plans of taking 20 trillion, you know, from pension fund as they said. But let's get your thoughts. Labor, of course, is upset. Everybody is upset. Atiku Abubakar is upset. Um, so uh, let me start by saying that. Um, 
yes, people need to be upset if you say uh, federal government wants to borrow money from the pension funds. But yeah. I think there's been so long um, this trust deficit with, with um, government and, and, and borrowing, both internally and externally. And I guess that's one of the reasons why people are, are upset. But fortunately, I've been speaking to some of, some of the um, players in, in the pension industry, yeah. and that's not really what the narrative is. Um, if you look at the Pension Act, there yeah, are a number of things and a number of ways that the pension um, fund companies can invest or where they can invest their money, short term, medium term, semi, long term. And so part of it is in infrastructure assets. When you come to, to Nigeria, um, who are the people who do infrastructure assets and what's the structure of building those things? Usually what you have is government awards the contract or says they want to build a road. Um, Sometimes they do biddings or tenders. Sometimes they just, you know, preferred bidder, yeah. and, and that's what happens. So speaking to them, um, what they're saying is that the government is speaking to them on how they can have, um, they can work with them, not have access to those funds. Work with them towards investing in some of the projects that they're looking at. But those, those, um, the investment structure and the way the, the funds are going to be used is going to be de determined by the, by the pension funds themselves. Um, are they willing? Pension fund um, organizations or companies have not been willing to invest in, in long-term Nigerian um, infrastructure assets because, like I said, there's this trust deficit, yeah. and you don't want to um, have him built over the last 20 years from, from zero to 19 trillion in terms of, of pension funds. Um, you, you have to be careful because these are people's future that you're that you yeah. you looking at. But also, when you consider the fact that um, inflation has gone up again to 33.69, um, where can you invest this money? Um, there's a limited amount you can put in the stock market so that it doesn't seem like you're gambling. Yeah. So usually what you do, or what pe most of the pension funds in Nigeria do, is invest in short-term money market instruments, treasury bills or government bonds that come out because at the end of the day, they, they know that they are going to be able to get their monies back one way or the other when <coughs> government pays one form um, of, um, from one, form, from one um, source of, any source of revenue that they have yeah. at the point at which those bills fall due, because once you don't pay, um, there's a default and your credit your credit ratings drop. So just understanding that and trying to work out that structure is not something that's going to happen yesterday. Um, it's going to take a bit of discussion for the pension funds to sit down, work out a structure of how they want to do it. Is it going to be their bonds? And if it's bonds, who are the kind of um, businesses that can actually partake in those? Um, infrastructure development projects so that they can also monitor that those funds are being used and those projects are being um, done in the, in the way and manner they are meant to be done. Because yeah. at the end of the day, once those projects are being used, what it does is you create economic benefit. So let me give a typical example. Um, housing for the low-income earners. Um, growing up in this Lagos, I know, you know he's, he's late now, but people still speak about Jack on the, Jack on the here, Jack on the estate. Investment in housing, yes. And, and when, I, when I remember those things, a lot of those investments in, in the housing scheme, it wasn't done directly by the government. It was facilitated by the Lagos State government. It was financed by First Bank. And civil servants were able to key into it and then you deduct their salary. So that's how um, PPPs yes. should work. And, and a, a lot of it was done through some form of direct labor um, um, construction. Um, having Ministry of Lagos State Ministry of Works and the the financiers themselves work together to bring out um, the supervisory structure, the things that you need, the infrastructure, uh, and, and so on. So that way, for me, I think it's something that the pension funds should look at, um, not just say, "Oh, government wants to borrow." borrow yeah, I, mean, I think borrow it's mostly because and, of tr the trust, trust that deficit that, that you mentioned. And, you know, and that I think those are the things that they're they're trying to. It's not, like I said, it's not going to be yesterday and it's not going to be today. It's going to be something that is probably going to take maybe the next three to six months to work out the kind of structures that you want to put in place towards ensuring that whether it's low-cost low housing or, or internal, um, whether you call them grade B or grade C roads that link um, um, markets locally um, within the jurisdiction. Again, trust deficit. That, that's really agree. what it is. You know? And if over, I, I, over time they have said, it made segments like this, you know, we're going to fix these roads. Give us a six-month time frame. Give us two-year time frame. It's going to be ready. We're going to tour. And it actually works like that. Uh, yeah, but, but that's your money. Yeah. But if I'm coming to, if you're coming to get money from me, it's a different thing entirely. I'll tell you the, the terms and conditions, and I will monitor them and ensure that they, they get done. Why? Because I need to get the returns from them. 
So you, you, you can't tell me that you want, I, I, you want to come and take money from me. I say, I say six months. You say six months you complete a project. And I don't monitor that you ensure that you complete it in, in six months. Why? Because if you don't complete it in six months and I'm extracting money from the seventh month, yeah. it's not going to come. So that's why I said the, the pension fund administrators and the pension um, fund agency system are going to be, they should, they, they should be responsible for setting out those structures, how you want to make them work, so that monies are not just going into um, projects yeah, ending. I, I agree. All right. Let's, All right. let's move to, uh, I think, River State. Yeah, of course. My enemy is now asleep with, my, with eyes open. Fubara, the ongoing drama between gov former Governor Nyeson Wiki and the Governor of Simnalai Fubara. What is, what is happening in River State? What do you make of the chaos that is happening in River State? Or would you say that this is the setting up of the structure as it should be? So, um, in my own opinion, um, there is an elected governor. He has been confirmed by an They've gone to courts, and the courts have, have confirmed that he's an elected governor. Let the governor work. Um, so all the people who are trying to say, oh, muscle him down, this is what he must do, let's also re let these people also remember that they too were governors, and nobody muscled them down. In fact, they were the ones that muscled other people before exactly. them. Exactly. So when it comes to that, let the man have a free hand. If you suggest people that he thinks that they are, they, are, they are going to be able to work with him towards providing the best in terms of, of um, quality governance in River State, then that's what you should let him do. You can't force upon me uh, what I should do. You can't take a horse to the river and then say he must yeah, but, the water. But irrespective of what you do, and, and I, hear, I, know, I hear, oh, I, I, I was the one who sponsored this. I was the one who did this. Your money? That's the first question I ask myself. Your money? And the man is, is an independent man. If he didn't want to run or if he wasn't interested in running, and you, then you wouldn't have sponsored him. Um, so sometimes you don't, um, like you say, you, you say, oh, he's a, he, might be, he might seem to be a weakling, but he also, and he also has to ensure that the people of River State who voted in him, he does the things that he's meant to, that he's meant to do, which is develop River State, pay salaries of workers in River State, make River State an economy that is buoyant and not at the whims of caprices of Mr. Yeah. A or Mr. B. Yeah. I mean, they, they keep trying to sell this narrative, you know, that, oh, working with Simfo is so toxic, and that's why, you know, people are resigning, and that's, you know, the reason the House of Assembly members also, you decide to leave, you know, and move to the APC, and um, that, yes, some week he had a structure that he had already set in line for River State, and so Simfo seems to be moving away from that structure. That's why they keep, you know, you know battling every, him. Every, every leader has, a, has, has his own way of thinking. Um, is he disrupting the structure? Does he feel that that's, those structures that were set were not the right ones and he's trying to trick them to make them the right ones? And if that's the case, then he has a case for him to tweak, tweak the structures. Um, has he stopped civil servants from going to work? No. Has he stopped people in River State from doing their businesses? No. Absolutely. So what structure are you talking about? You're talking about a, straight, a, 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 a state governance structure, a management structure that he feels, in my own opinion, that... I think I need to tweak it here and there. You can't be, he's the leader of the state. So you as, um, um, as um, um, a state assembly members should be able to work with him. If he says he doesn't agree with it, so what other solutions have we provided? He says, oh, let's tweak it this way. You have not said, you say, oh, he's destroying the structures. What structures are you talking about? The yeah. structures are the people. And so if he, as the leader of the people in River State, decides that he wants to tweak one structure here and there, then you should ask him why. How, what are the benefits that are going to come out from it? Rather, you are jumping in and saying, oh, no, 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 he's, he's destroying structures that were set. There were structures that were set by the um, um, governor, Odili. Yes. Um, Amici came in, improved on those structures. You came in, you improved on those structures. So what makes you think that your structures are the best? They are talking political structures now, not actually structures that benefit well, the state. I, 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 political structures, they should go and fight it out in the PDP. Yeah. The state structures that will govern the state and make it economically buoyant are the structures that we should, we should talk about. Yeah. But let's also remember that these political structures that he is talking about, other people had political structures that he came in and rearranged. So why wouldn't the governor want to rearrange his own political I structures? Agree. All right. On the Daily Independent, it says banks can demand social media handles of customers, the court rules. This, of course, you know, has gotten a few people worried. 
uh, because they feel like it is, um, it's too, it, 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 I mean, what, what business does the CBN or does the bank have with Master Chimene handle? Um, I mean, so do you think that this should be a cause of, of, of concern? There are, two, there are two sides to it. If you use a social media handle to do business, mm -hmm. where people, you advertise, you pay money, monies go through that based on accounts that are run by banks and are monitored by the CBN, then I should know KYC. If it's my personal social media handle where I tweet my face and, and my family members, then it's none of the business of CBN. And I think that's where the issue is. I can't be doing business on Instagram, on, on um, whatever social media platform, and then I want to do KYC to be sure that this person, who I did, is the person behind this, and not you. Mm -hmm. So those are questions I need to ask. And the banks need to do KYC, because funds are being channeled through their banks. What if his money is that are used for, for criminal activities? How do you so, know I mean, that? But so the, the issue is, what is the methodology to it? Yeah. Um, and I, like I said, I can't be doing business on, if you're doing business in your business premises and you open a bank account, and you're putting your bank account and the details of that bank on, on, on your forms, the first thing they ask you is, show us an evidence of Location. the receipts of where you are. Yeah. And it's the same thing I would look at it from a social media perspective. If I'm using Instagram to sell, show us evidence that it belongs to you. Yeah, but, but how do you determine who's doing a business on Instagram and who isn't? So, you know, why should... I mean, I don't have any plans of doing business on Instagram. That's you. Okay, so why, and, why then should I give you my social media handle? And, and, and so, the, like, like I said, there are two parts to it. If it's something that has to do with something that would affect the business or transactions being done with the bank, yes, I would agree to that. It's the same way as telling me, I'm coming to visit your, your what's it called, your premises. Mm -hmm. So if, I'm, if, if New Central, for instance, is saying, oh, this is where we are and you want to open a bank account, I will tell you that I'll come to New Central and come and be sure that you have the equipment that you even say that you have. And it's the same way that if I'm, if I'm running an Instagram account to run business, the bank has a right. Corporate account. Yeah. Whether it's corporate or individual, and okay. you're running it as a business, the bank has a right. Even as individuals, when you open your account, if it's not salary account where they know where your office is, but if it's an individual, you walk in there, they will tell you, okay, tell us where your residence is. Yes. And they would, they would sometimes send people to come and check and ask. So it's the same thing. So I can't be doing business for which my bank name, an account that has been generated by the bank, are you with me, is being showed to the whole world, and I don't know who is behind it. I mean, well, I mean, like you said, they, they need to, you know, ex explain these modalities, you know, um, clearer for people, because I know that there's still going to be issues. Um, uh, for I, I feel like if you have a corporate account, it, this is obviously a business account, and, you know, your business is social media, you know, then maybe... Maybe there's a conversation to be had there, but you know, as a private, you know, um, individual, uh, you no, might no, I, I, I won't. I, I won't support. Yeah. KY. You, you, I can't if if you don't have dealings with me. I, I, what am I doing KYC for? I mean, if we're talking business as well, how would you say that this impacts um, influencers on social media? How would it? How does this impact influencers? Social media influencers. Social media influencers also, because they're doing a business. When they influence, they they, they sell their products and their services using that, that social media account. Mm -hmm. And there is an account number that is attached to it. Oh, for services, pay, etc. Well, it may not even be that they are selling. Uh, but yeah, even they then, can be selling for but, others. But even then, as a bank, and you work with that bank, and, you have, um, and you're an influencer, in my own opinion, and this is my opinion, I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to, to say what the courts say or what the banks are thinking. In my own opinion, and you do that, part of the things that generate the income for you that comes into those banks or flows through those banks come from that your influencer status on that social media. And what if you're doing cyber crimes with people that I can't say? At the end of the day, if something happens and it blows up, the bank also comes, you know, will be held liable that you're, you're laundering money yeah. and, and, and so on. So, like I said, individual, your lifestyle, that's, my, that's your business. But things that have to do with the fact that it has a relationship with monies flowing through your bank account, and I, I work in that bank and I, own that and I ensure that those transactions need to be legitimate, need to be clean, then I guess it's time for you to do some KYC. Well, now that you mentioned the, the cybercrime bit, I remember that as an aside, 
that I realized for the first time that people who are into internet fraud are now doing adverts on social media. Exactly. I saw one two days ago, and he put up a post of, I mean, I was I was in awe, but not in a, in a good way. I was, it, it was terrible. What about anyway. OnlyFans? What about? <laughs> I didn't hear that. He was asking about OnlyFans. What is OnlyFans? What only about OnlyFans? I mean, it's uh, social media influencing. Yeah, uh, since so. Oh. Anyway, let's... Is it a, are you an only fan? <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, still looking at the Daily Independent newspaper. Tinubu's government has shown transparency in financial dealings. According to Shetima, would you agree with that position? Well, there, there was a, a Fitch report that has upgraded our, our credit rating. So, I, and I'll make this very short. If he's speaking about that, then, based on that report, yes, he has shown transparency. Um, for the credit ratings to... To go up, it means that Fitch must have asked a few questions and see if, seen a few things, um, and, and so that I don't, you know, we don't, we don't, uh, nobody thinks that we're being yeah. political here. All right, I want us to go back to the Vanguard again as well, okay. um, and talk about the minimum wage because it's been an ongoing conversation um, back and forth between the NLC, TUC, and the federal government. The latest offering from the government being forty-eight thousand. Um, NLC rejected labor is of course showing that. There are hints about raising the offer according to the Vanguard. But what are your thoughts about what their ask is? Is their ask realistic? And what would be a more realistic ask? What Libra is asking for, 615000 uh, I think is, is, is way off the mark. Um, that's my opinion. Um, what the government is proposing, and although the government will tell you that in percentage terms, they've tried to increase salaries by 60%, which is plenty. Oh, he, he, <laughs> he's shaking head. But that's what government is going to be telling you. Um, talking to different people, various analysts, people are saying maybe between 120, 200,000, because some of these a number of these states, because once you de determine the minimum wage across the board, it means that it affects everybody. Um, can they fund it? They need to start to look for um, internally generated funds to augment, um, and look for people to, to create investments that will generate the kind of money that they want. But in my own opinion, maybe between 120 and 200,000. That's that's me. Okay. And two hundred thousand. Okay. Two hundred thousand. But it, another thing is, is, is that even, you know, achievable by the current Nigerian government? You know, seeing how they want to struggle. I, I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think they have the funding for it. Like I said, some states have not even started paying the thirty thousand minimum yeah. wage, and it's been on for the last at Three least years. four years. Yes. Um, and and you know, would you expect you know, that the current administration, seeing how much. Um, disruption, you know, their policies are brought into Nigeria's economic reality since they came in. Would you expect that they would be fighting hard to see how much, you know, they can improve on Nigeria's earnings so that they can earn, uh, so that they can improve on the minimum wage? Well, I, I think they're doing, they, they, they're, they're doing a number of things. Um, so, for instance, from the monetary policy side, um, they've done a number of things to try and check and, 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 and increase the inflow of, of, of FX into the country. But yes. like you know, every market, there are, there are ups and downs. Um, and try and find what I think they believe is a realistic exchange rate. I don't know what it is. Stability has come in a bit. People are more um, cautious about, OK, it's probably going to be between 1, 2, 1, 5, 1, 1,000, 1, 5. So we can play with that and, and, and work on our budgets. Um, but in terms of the fiscal part, um, which my, the chairman of the of the fiscal and tax committee has already started, you know, putting out some statements after a, a long hiatus with 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 the press. Um, that's where the next thing has to come in. How do you create um, that velocity of money yeah. to work so that you can start to create new wealth, additional wealth for people? And and until that is really synced in with the um, with the monetary policies, then there may still be that gap. Then the other part of it is oil theft. If we don't move our oil production to at least 1.8 million barrels on a daily basis, then we're still going to, we're, it's going to be a fire crack. And is that, is, that, is that an impossible task? Nothing is impossible. Yeah, I mean, why I say so is because... I, 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 I think it's, it's, it's also getting all stakeholders to sit down. Um, I, I don't know who the oil thieves are, but of course, they can be, they are either Nigerians or working with Nigerians, you know, and these are the realities that we need to sit down. Um, the president and the minister of, 
of petroleum resources. You really have to sit down with all stakeholders and say, how do we curb this so that it can get more people to bring back investments into the oil and gas sector and then start to open up the 10-year um, gas, gas plan for Nigeria so that that investment can start coming in. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about uh, discos. Electricity, most right. discos are technically insolvent, NERC says or declares. Let me quickly read the quotes. Nigeria has a unique opportunity and potential to achieve energy security and sufficiency for itself and the entire West African subregion. And this is former Ghanaian President uh, John Mahama. And uh, we have another one, Bath Naji, uh, founder of uh, Geometric uh, Power. Former minister. Yes, and former minister. He did say that Nigeria has 206.53 trillion cubic feet of untapped gas reserves, yet there is not enough natural gas or even liquefied petroleum gas for use in the kitchen. And the final uh, reaction would be from engineer Sanusi Garba, NERC chairman. He says, today when you look at distribution companies, they are clearly and technically insolvent. And you also want them to raise capital in terms of debt or equity. It's a Herculean task. Which I agree with. Um, it's it's um, over the last 10 years since is it full privatization of, of the generation and the distribution um, value chain of, of the energy sector. We only hear about the GEMCOs and the DISCOs. Um, uh, the energy business is an inverted pyramid. If customers aren't paying, then there's no money within the system. Yeah. That's the reality. Some of the biggest debtors are government agencies. Um, some time back, we saw that even the presidency was, was, was going money. Same thing with state, state, state houses, I, I, that, uh, that, government that, houses. And this, some of these debts have been long outstanding. Now, you don't have enough meters. Um, in my own opinion, I think one of the things that the federal and the state governments should actually sit down and work out with the discos is how do we create a metering system that is funded to over close time. Close the metering gap. Yeah, but, 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 uh, but not, that is... not expecting people to buy meter, not yeah. even with the conditions in Nigeria. So closing the metering gap, you know, and of course, you know, there's also power theft. Yeah, so if, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you do the metering system more efficiently, you there will be a reduction theft. in power yeah. theft. And what you then find out is that people become, um, we're very wasteful when it comes to power. Yeah, I agree. Are, and power is not cheap. When I say this, people will tell me, oh, no, but, but that's not true. We've been having it cheap for a long time. Because government has pumped so much money into it over time. We're like newborn babies. I, I, want, uh, I, don't, I don't want to drink nutrient. I want to take Cerilac. So I'm used to Cerilac. No, yeah. But sometimes you need to readjust and go to nutrient. Sometimes you even need to go to corn milk. And, and, and that's the reality. And to readjust to do that, I think the government needs to sit down with the energy value chain and say, okay, this goes. What is the gap in metering? We are going to provide an access fund, and you must give us these commitments in terms of doing that. We work with our partners, wherever they are in the world, both locally. And that, what that does is that government will put that money into is That's infrastructure. And you don't expect people to pay. But you would collect. You see, the, for every meter, there is a renter. Yeah. Growing up, I've always known that meters in the house, for every time you pay an electricity bill, for those that used to pay electricity bill, there's a renter. Part of it is the meter. Part of it is the infrastructure that has been used to manage those things. And even up till today, when you vend, there is a rental part of it in that vending. You know, so that's what needs to be done. So all this one of saying, oh, increase this band or don't increase that band. The, the band system has always been in Nigeria. You had industrial, you had commercial, you had residential. When it was then, there were four, four band rates for residential. I agree. I and that, so, all these things is put the meters in place. In today's world where there is a, um, a lot of theft in the system, put prepaid meters in place. Monitor the, the, the metering system ac across transformers and the transmission um, networks and the distribution networks. And then you will start to see people will pay for electricity that is being used. And not only that, it's, only, it's cheaper. And then you see more people be able to do more things. Because if I have it. 12 to 18 hours of power, for instance. You can achieve a whole lot yes. more. Yes, and I sell pure water. Lot of money. Mm. My fridge is forever cold. Yeah. I, I remember seeing someone, you know, post yesterday that um, she saved about 700, 700 900,000 naira in a 
two week you know time frame and this is money she normally would be using to buy diesel or buy you know uh, and that's petrol. the reality save a lot of money for our business yeah um which of course has improved or she's been able to direct that money into other places to improve our business you can, which is you can actually used to upscale your business. Yes. So like I said, if you're selling pure water and in in in, in one month you make a savings of nine hundred thousand, you buy you could right. buy two and more fridges and, and become a distributor. Well I mean so but these are the challenges with the with the discos, you know, and I've had I've had too many conversations, you know, back then in in the southeast. I used to have conversations with uh, the um, EEDC, that's what they were called, Inigo Electric Distribution Company. And they mentioned all these metering gaps, mentioned power theft. Mentioned, you know, a lot of their problems are infrastructural, you know, deficits. And they don't have you know, the funds. They don't. Be, they so people. government, for, so for me, it's an inverted pyramid. If customers are not paying, Jenkos are not going to get money. Yeah. And that's the reality. So where do you tackle it from? You can't be tackling it from building more power plants. We must tackle it from investing in meters, getting a system that will meter everybody that is not paid for, but will be paid over time. It's a lease. Yeah, but we still need to build more power plants. I we can't. We you. can't be having this conversation with three thousand megawatts of electricity we, know, nationwide. All right, three thousand. Yeah, but but there is a cap, there is a visibility for capacity of fifteen thousand megawatts. Mm, yeah, but people are not paying. How do I how do I do that? And that's the reality. Well, <laughs> we, we we do all Nigerians want really is to see an improved power supply. You know, and whatever the metrics are, the dynamics are, we just want to see more power. We will start from less metric. expenses. It Thank you so much for joining us this Thank morning. Thank you for having me in the studio this All morning. All right. And uh, we still have more to come this morning as we gradually get to the end of the show. Do stay with us this morning on Breakfast Central. Former Vice President of Nigeria, Alhaji Atiku Abubakar, has criticized the federal government's proposal to use 20 trillion naira from pension funds for infrastructure projects labeling the plan as illegal. In a statement on Wednesday, the ex-Vice President said on his ex-account that the law only required that 5% of the fund be used for infrastructural projects. Abu Bakr exp expressed concerns over the proposal by Wali Edun, the Minister of Finance, to quote-unquote unlock pension funds for national projects. Now, similarly, the Nigerian Labour Congress and the Trade Union Congress, TUC, has expressed its uh, disapproval to the Finance Minister in a letter on Thursday. On Tuesday, Ole Edu emphasized that the initiative to deploy the pension funds was aimed at stabilizing the economy amidst elevated inflation and interest rates. Now, stressing the strict regulatory framework governing the pension uh, industry, he assured that the government is committed to compliance to safeguard workers' pensions. Uh, let's quickly share, you know, um, from Wale Edu before we uh, get into the conversation. It has come to my notice that there are stories making around that the federal government plans to illegally access the hard-earned savings and pension contributions of workers. Nothing could be further from the truth. The pension industry, like most of the financial industry, is highly regulated. There are rules, there are limitations about what pension money can be invested in and what it cannot be invested in. The federal government has no intention whatsoever to go beyond those limits and go outside those bounds, which are there to safeguard uh, the pensions of workers. Now, what was announced to the Federal Executive Council, merely for noting, merely for information, um, no approval was sought for any action whatsoever, was that there was an ongoing initiative drawing in all the major stakeholders in the long-term savings industry, those that handle funds that are available over a long period, to see how within the rules, within the regulations and the laws, these funds could be used maximally, most effectively, to drive investment in key growth areas. We're joined this morning by finance expert, program director, and adjunct professor of business, Western um, uh, Governor University, uh, Dr. Matthew Ogumbukola. Uh, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Uh, good morning. Thank you for inviting me also. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's already a lot of, you know, emotions that um, um, arose yesterday when these stories uh, came. Um, it's... I mean, from later conversations, I'm starting to see like it's a, a, a trust deficit challenge, you know, with the Nigerian people and the Nigerian government. 
Um, but help us explain, you know, break it down. It is expected that pension funds are investments um, already. Does the nation currently have its pension funds readily seated in an account to begin with? You know, do we have up to 20 trillion naira just waiting, you know, to be invested? Uh, well, I mean, uh, looking at the Pension Act of uh, the way it is structured, the pension fund already is, is already being invested in maybe shares and bonds and maybe other international uh, investment platform. But uh, looking at what uh, the former vice president was talking about is that you should don't, I mean, they should not just take this money and invest in infrastructure. Really going about what the honorable minister also said, and uh, I was also in Nigeria uh, two weeks ago. Uh, the Nigerian government, the Nigeria economy needs a lot of infrastructure to build up the economy. And uh, I know that, like he said, you can't just dip your hand into the pension fund because of the act. The act is strict and uh, is well regulated. But I also know that Canada and Australia has similar uh, scheme like this, where they also use their pension fund to invest in the economy, also, also invest outside. But looking from the noise from everywhere, which is, which is also a good noise, is that uh, from past experience, I know like our own fathers worked and at the end of the day, they, didn't, they weren't able to get anything from their pension after they had retired. That is why this, that's why the pension fund came and, and it's been managed by private sector fund managers. So what I expect from government at this point in time is like, and which he said, is to have more dialogue with the stakeholders, different stakeholders, and to be sure that they follow strictly through the law. Right now, those, those pension funds are invested in, in structured investment where government can monitor and regulator also can monitor it. All right. Uh, just to also clarify, obviously, Nigeria has been a very challenge, has been through a very tumultuous time economically, yeah. and uh, there's a lot of trust deficit that is uh, at play here. At the slightest, uh, uh, at the slightest look of uh, anything that would infringe on the hardship or cause more hardship to Nigerians, of course, there will be a reaction. Uh, how exactly can the government? Uh, calm down the fears of the Nigerian people. Now, we know that the Nigerian Pensions Guide, only a maximum of 10% can be allotted to infrastructure. Uh, so, um, is, 20, uh, is 20 billion 10% of our pensions fund won? And how can we deal with this trust deficit that's currently existing? Well, I mean, the best thing for government is to come up, uh, be transparent. They need to be transparent in everything that they do. They need to really, and like he said in his word, it's just an information. So they need to break it down, meet with every stakeholder involved. You have the Nigerian Labour Congress, which you need to carry along and let them understand where you're going to invest the money in. And when you invest it, when is the return coming back in? So that when people retire, they don't, they don't get back and they don't get back to their pension uh, uh, managers and they end up with it, they can't, they can't get any money. So they need to be transparent. They need to have a lot of stakeholders meeting with various stakeholders and be transparent in whatever in whatever industry that they are really uh, investing the money. Like I said, Australia does this, Canada does this, and it's been helpful to their economy. But in both in both countries, there are strict laws in certain industry they cannot invest in those industry. But in certain industry they can invest there because uh, they know that the return on investment is quick. And the, and the return on investment is guaranteed. So, the, so we need to know where they want to invest those money in and enlighten people. Yeah. Um, I mean, these are, you know, obviously also just signs that the Nigerian government is constantly in search of funding uh, right. from one sector or the other. It's not cybersecurity yeah. levy. It is pension fund. If it's not pension fund, it is going to be something else. And so... What would you, you know, expect that they're, you know, what steps do you think that they should be taking if they truly are trying to raise money to fix the infrastructural deficit, you know, that we currently have, you know, across the country? Um, Nigerians are tired of hearing about roads. You know, we've been, we've been fixing roads forever. Um, there's so much more that needs to be done, obviously, to take us from where we are today 
to, you know, you know, into a much more developed society. And every government, successive, successive government has, to a large extent, failed. So, I mean, what, what other um, pathways would you advise the current administration to look into if we truly are trying to raise more money to fix the same infrastructural deficit? Well, I mean, like you, like you rightly said, we've been in this for a long time, fixing road all the time, doing, uh, most especially, the way I see this government being run and where they should look more is partnering with the private sector. And as Nigerians also, you know, when we are back home, we tend to think every infrastructure has to be done by government. There needs to be in a paramount change, a mind change. Our mind needs to change. Over here, some roads are told. When you pass through them, you have to pay toll. If you don't pay the toll or you don't have the you don't have the device to pay that to, they'll send you your receipts back home. So most of this infrastructure needs to go to the private sector, but we're regulated. Because another problem is that when you when you bring in the, the PPP uh, uh, initiative, it becomes too expensive. If government can regulate this, those PPP that they do with private sector and make sure that the burden doesn't fall too much on the people, I think the people will understand. Everybody, like, I listened to your last conversation. Light, yes, everybody wants light. I told you I was just back two weeks ago, and uh, most of the time, I ran generator all through. If there was light, yeah, people are ready to pay for it, and that can also create uh, small-scale industries where people can then work. So for me, it's for them to partner more with the private sector, and also, they can also raise for fund through bonds. They can they can they can raise fund through bond if it's not that expensive. Because right now all over the world the dollar is expensive, not just in Nigeria. And that's what I keep telling people, not just in Nigeria, in in major countries, the dollar is expensive. That's why each country is trying to work with one another. They say, oh you take my currency when I buy from you, then I take your currency because the dollar is expensive. Nobody know why that is. Inflation is high everywhere. Over here, inflation is also on the rise. People are, and that's why the election is, the election over here now is, is seen on just one, on just one platform, the economy. What, what will happen? Inflation is high everywhere. So I, I believe that government should look more into private partnership with the private sector, but also look at the pricing so that it doesn't become a burden on, on the citizen. Do, do you, do you see this government as, you know, government that is thinking? Well, I mean, from some of the initiatives that they've done, you, you can understand that the majority of people in this government understand the problem. But, you know, uh, we had we had an election that was polarized, just like every, every other nation, when you're at the crossroad. The election was based on, well, I, I probably say on sentiment. So when... Even if even if it wasn't this government that was in, if it was the other government that was also in, they will also face the, the same problem. And that's why I say Nigerians should we should forget the electionary period. Now it's time to come together and work together as one and make sure uh, you don't need attacking government all the time. Yes, they are going to come up with proposal, but if they are really transparent, like the way they've been doing, bringing out things out and and seeking stakeholders' uh, uh, voices on it. We should be able to get out of the wood quickly. That's my... All right. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Here. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we certainly will update. We'll keep following up with the story. And if uh, more developments come, we'd we'll, we'll love to have you back again. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Thank and as we get closer to the end of the show, let's share with you what our top story of the week is. Okay. So, um, do you want to go first, or do I go first? Mine, I mean, <clears throat> mine would have been the boy child, but that was just today. So it, has <laughs> it to can be, be your, no, it can be your top story of the week, of course. No, it I doesn't matter. Very, I think I've already put in too much energy into that already this morning. It's, you know, I, I will move on. Not moving on, but you know, um, I've said enough. Um, I think mine will have to be the conversations concerning labour, NLC, TUC, and of course your demands for higher minimum wage. Which, of course, it's, it is you know, expected of them to demand better pay for the Nigerian worker. Um, it is expected that they will um, fight for the Nigerian worker and for better um, standard of living of the Nigerian worker. But, you know, there have, of course, been criticisms, you know, with their demands of 600,000 naira minimum wage. 
a lot of people, you know, have said that that's which will think it's not going to happen. Nigeria can't even afford it. What is a a, a much more reasonable figure? Maybe a hundred thousand, maybe two hundred thousand, minimum wage. But even at that, you know, there's still arguments of whether the country can afford, you know, one hundred fifty thousand naira minimum wage or one hundred thousand naira minimum wage. States are struggling to even pay thirty thousand. They continue to take loans. They continue to borrow. They continue to, of course, you know, to to struggle to pay even the thirty thousand. Um, um, and so, you know, talking about a hundred or two hundred thousand, you might also be, be, be wishful thinking. My thoughts, you know, are really about, you know, whether Niger what can Nigeria afford. So when the government puts forward 48,000 naira, which of course happened a couple of days ago, as their offer, you know, to labor, and labor says well, that's an insult to the Nigerian people, fair and good. But what can, the Ni what can Nigeria currently afford as a suitable minimum wage? What is a good figure that would be, we can describe as a living wage for the average Nigerian, seeing the change that has happened in the last one year since this administration came in? A living wage from 2015 is not the same thing with a living wage in 2024. Very, very different. Far cry because of our current economic realities. Inflation hitting 40%, um, then food inflation 40%, and of course inflation um, generally at 33.9% or 6%. So, I mean, the realities are different. What, you know, would be a perfect living wage? 60,000, 90,000 a month, seeing how much a bag of rice is. Um, and also, what can the Nigerian government afford? What efforts need to be also put in place so that Nigeria can earn more money? I think there's too many questions that are left unanswered, but we always just get distracted with the back and forth concerning labor and the Nigerian government. And until these questions are answered, it's difficult for labor to put forward a figure and say, this is our demand. Because no matter how many times you make that demand, if the country can't afford it, it can't afford it. And so, you know, of course, we then would ask that the current administration shares with Nigerians what its plans are to afford better minimum wage for Nigerian people for Nigerian people in the next couple of years. And also, you know, what figures would be better. Let's start the conversation from there. That's, you know, for me is my top story of the week. Um, I'm sure that there will be more developments into it next week, and you know we'll, we'll definitely continue to follow up. And uh, my top story of the week will, of course, be what's happening in River State Governor Sinalai Fubara should be allowed to be a governor. It's been never-ending drama between the past governor of River State, Governor Nyeso Mike, and his uh, predecessor, or rather his successor, Governor Sinalai Fubara. What we've seen is a lot of resignations in River State, lots of decamping. The People's Democratic Party have come out to state that the seats of the House of Assembly members who vacated their seats are currently vacant, even though we know that there was a peace accord that seemingly reinstated them back to the position they once left behind. We've seen a lot of, uh, we've seen the Commissioner of Justice, of course, being sworn in. We've seen a lot of appointments being done, still a lot of resignations. And uh, in today's newspaper, Governor Simnalai Fubara says that his enemies go to bed with their eyes open. River State is it has become a, a, a pot. I'm looking for the right words to use, but it would seem that River State, they're trying to make, make River State ungovernable, which is not a kind thing to the people of River State. So if everyone, and I'm talking past governor, present governor, I'm talking House of Assembly members, I'm talking traditional rulers, if everyone has the interest of the River's people at heart, the goal now will be to look at how to push the state forward. How to put chaos behind, chaos that involves looking for how to pull down the assembly complex and, you know, all the drama that distracts from governance and politics. Let's stop playing politics with River State and focus on governance. And it's everyone that's involved. And I said this before, I'll say it again. The past governor, the present governor, the House of Assembly members, the People's Democratic Party, the All Progressives Congress, everyone has a role to play in ensuring that normalcy is returned to River State. And that'll be all that we have for you today on Breakfast Central. Thank you for joining us on this week's broadcast. We'll be back again at the same time with different stories. There'll be developing stories, of course, over the weekend. And you can follow up with these ones on Breakfast Central starting tomorrow and on Sunday as well. As we get out of the studio, let's share with you what's happening later today on New Central. Just Siri comes your way 10 a.m. West African time. In the game is up at 1 p.m. West African time. And of course, for Fanwa Africa, at 2 p.m. West African time. And uh, this is where we say goodbye. Thank you very much. Like Olive mentioned, breakfast extra tomorrow morning and on Sunday. 
Um, it's bye from me. We'll be back here again on Monday morning. Happy International Day of the Boy Child. And um, I am Osalgi Ogbon. And I am Olive Emodi. As you go out to enjoy on Friday, do not drink and drive. Make sure you turn up with sense. And we'll see you again on Monday. Au revoir.